All right, welcome back to Medium Pool episode seven, Felix and Jacob. Yeah, we just had to we had to do it to him. We got we had to record another episode. You know, the show must go on. J- Jack's a little sick. He's got the COVID. Yeah, finally, finally caught it. You know, thankful I got it. This laid in. We have all of, like the tools to kind of combat it. It was like a bad cold for a while, but uh, I'm I'm past the worst of it. But at least like you know you could just chill at home. You know. Yeah. Like you didn't have like, did you really have too many obligations, right? No. It sucks when you get sick and you have like hella shit going on. Mm-hmm. You know, highs and lows of life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes you you know you feel really good, and sometimes you feel like shit. It's just a roller coaster of life, a big circus, as Fellini would say. Yeah, like I, I shot a funeral today. How are you doing? You just got back from a trip. Yeah. I had a little Easter trip. Yeah, it was fun. It was all right. Some, some surprises, some disappointments. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes, man. There's like these things that you look forward to in the future that you expect, mm-hmm. that it's going to be like a really good thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's things that come out of nowhere that are surprising and really fun or whatever. And in life, it's always like the thing that you expected, like falls through, doesn't happen. But then there's things that come in that surprise you. Yeah. You know? Whenever and that's how I would describe the trip to, to my little trip to Portland. Whenever you're looking forward to something, some event that's coming up, you always have an idea in your head of like how you want it to go. You play through all the little scenarios in your head of how you think it's going to go. Mm-hmm. It never goes that way. No, man. Like it never get like, I don't know why we do it. We waste so much time thinking about how things are going to go, how we can make it perfect. Mm. It never goes that way. No, it never, it never goes what you planned for sure. But for some reason, like it's the human condition to imagine the best case scenario in every situation, even though we know it's never going to happen. It's just, I don't know. That's just something that I find very fascinating about humans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most things like I feel like just like fall through or your expectation or whatever, but it's just the wild trip of life. Yeah. And you yeah. just got to ride the wave because you just never know what's behind the next door, you know? Right now I'm wearing my t-shirt and my champion shorts, you know? I'm in my right outfit for our discussion. Because we watched Murder Mystery 2 and then we backtracked and we watched Murder Mystery 1. Yeah, so I'm wearing, I'm, I'm I'm in my Sandler fit right now, you know, like something chill, like shorts and stuff. You know, I was wearing something way nicer earlier because, like I said, I shot a funeral, like I filmed a funeral, so I wanted to look like I was professional, and I was better dressed than a lot of people at the funeral, dude. Really? Yeah. And the woman's like, "Thank you so much for, thank you so much for filming. Like you're so good. Like you're really good." At the end. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm sure it's an emotional time. Yeah, she's like, it looks so good. I never met someone like who's so calm. Oh. And I was like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's so sweet. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I'm in my Sandler fit because we're going to be talking about the Sandman today, which I've been looking forward to because we talk about him a lot sometimes with our friends. and Yeah. Also, we just watched Murder Mystery 2, and then we watched Murder Mystery 1 in that order. I had seen Murder Mystery 1 when it first came out in 2019. I put my aunt and uncle when I was living there. Mm-hmm. But I kind of forgot about what happened. And then Murder Mystery 2 came out a few weeks ago on Netflix, and then we just, like, watched it and shit. And then yeah. we, we watched Murder Mystery 1. Yeah. So we get the full picture of everything. Which one did you think was better, dude? I thought Murder Mystery 2 was better. Yeah, dude, I, I think I agree. Yeah. I, th- I agree. Okay, we might have cheat codes because yeah. we smoked a doobie halfway through Murder Mystery 2. Murder Mystery 2 was, like, significantly better after I smoked. Yeah. I don't know, like, it, it's hard to tell because, like, there's a transition when they get to Paris and it's 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 really good and funny from there. Mm. The shit before that in Murder Mystery 2, I was, like, ready to turn it off, dude. It was so boring, dude. Murder Mystery 2, I think, is the better movie. Watching Murder Mystery 1, we kind of knew who like, like what was going to happen because of all the characters that were in the second one. Yeah, like, there's two characters in the second one that were in the first one. Mm. I guess there's three with the cop or whatever. You know who's going to survive and you know who's not the killer based on just... Those two people there alive and introduced again in Murder Mystery 2. I think maybe like the plot of the first one was better. Mm-hmm. But I think the execution and the second one, it was like more fun. And mm-hmm. the I think the action was also a little better as well. Mm-hmm. It just maybe was a little uneven, but 
Should we talk about like what they're about? I mean, there's not really anything. <laughs> it's like, literally, it's about it's an Adam Sandler movie, right? So basically, it's made for the everyday American guy or like family wants to feel like comfort and these campy jokes. They're like, oh, we're gonna go to Europe, and to like these people, they're watching this Adam Sandler movie. Like, Europe is this like crazy foreign place, you know? You don't really name it by a country. It's more of like a like a bunched up you know, kind of foreignness mm. to it. All the jokes are made for like that, like small town, good Connecticut, Boston mm. family or whatever, you know, like, yeah, people I, in Ohio. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's like the Adam Sandlerness of it. They bring it him and Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. yeah. No, she definitely elevates it. Like yeah. an Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston movie definitely elevates it. I think a different level than his like usual mediocre trash mm-hmm. shit because those ones are like trash. But I think when Jennifer Aniston hops on the project, it's kind of like, oh, like this, we're going to have some production on this. We're going to have some. Yeah. It's going to be a high value product. It's with, not with him. Aniston. And I love and I love Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. Yeah. She's great in it. It's not just him and like his like dude friends. It's like yeah. him and her riffing. Yeah. And she brings like she has the name recognition. She carries like the Jennifer Aniston-ness with her, yeah. you know. She's sexy, but she's like down to earth, you yeah. know. Like Yeah, she's you know. she's great. Yeah. Um She's a good actor. And yeah. she's also iconic and just And when they like riff with each other, it's like kind of fun you know you mm. just have like fun with it mm. it's, it's like oh it's like a husband and wife fighting about their everyday fights you know but they, they never get malicious with it it's always something that's like lighthearted. the first one is actual murder mystery and the second one is like a kidnapping mystery that's right <laughs> yeah that's like right. the first one is an actual like who done it that they get mixed up in and they get blamed yeah and then the second one is like a kidnapping mystery where they also kind of get, they also get blamed. So they kind of follow the same formula. It's just like a different plot devices and stuff. Yeah. It's about these two very like middle class people. She's a hairdresser. He's on the beat cop and they're from New York and they're suddenly thrust into this world of like extreme wealth and just like high class and they're they're out of their depths but that but because they're so grounded and relatable to the everyday audience you're rooting for them even though they're kind of idiot savants yeah that's what kind of like that's kind of the premise of all these like these movies right it's like yeah they're idiots but just but you relate to them yeah yeah they're just like normal salt of the earth Mm mm-hmm People like live in their day, you know, hairdresser, cop, they strive to be bigger than that because everyone has dreams. Yeah. In this country, yeah. we have dreams. <laughs> yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. And Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston's character, they live out their dreams in this. Yeah. And it's like a happy, feel good Adam Sandler movie, mm-hmm. basketball shorts, t shirt wearing Adam Sandler looking scruffy. Yeah, he's looking scruffy. He, lo- he looks yeah. like they didn't really do much costuming for this. No, like that's his brand. Yeah. That's literally his brand. And it, like, it does kind of work with that everyday man type thing, you know? Yeah. Schlucky American is like, yeah. Lovable guy. He's just a relatable guy. And because you, you also just seen him in so much stuff. Yeah. And also, he's just kind of like, he's kind of like a little schmucky guy. Like, yeah. Brings his own values. And... But I will say, you know, well, he may not be like, you know, revered or this like high form of comedy. Well, now I think now he's revered. So, yeah. I mean, he's revered for like what? Like, his, like just, Uncut Gems. Uncut Gems, but also just his career. Yeah. I think he deserves a lot more respect than he gets because. Of, of the like, trash movies he does. Because of his trash movies, because there's something to be said about how how they, they're comforting for people, you know? Yeah. Like, a movie doesn't have to be amazing and have this in-the-half amazing, you know, surreal message and everything. Mm. It can just be, like, a fun time. We have a friend, Luke, who, like, loves these movies. And I kind of love that he loves them, because... It's not like he's trying to be a cinephile all the time. Like, he he genuinely sometimes just wants to enjoy a movie and, like, tune out to, like, a silly, ridiculous comedy. Yeah, yeah. Adam Sandler is, like, perfect just to throw it on, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, these these movies are a little surprising to me. Like, the I think the second one, like, when it shifts to the action, they go to Paris, it does get, like, much better. And then this action scene... The action scenes in there are, like, really good in the second one. Yeah, the, the like car chase really scene. Yeah, 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 the car chase scene. And they crash it into the wall. Yeah. All of that is, like, really top-notch shit. 
And I was like, what the fuck? Did Tom Cruise produce this? Because, yeah. like, the stunts they were pulling off, I was like, this looks sick. No, it's a real movie that could actually be released in theaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's of that level of production value. And some of the jokes are really funny, too. Yeah, it's, it's actually really surprising, and it, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. Like, the second one's, like, an hour 30, and the first one's hour 38. Yeah. Dude, that second one, it just, like, it just, like, kind of moves along, and having a good enough time. I was actually, like, pleasantly surprised, in a way, yeah. by it, because it's just, like, was fun to watch with, like, a bro, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you recommend it if you just want to put on a little feel-good little thing. I don't know if I'd watch them again, though. <laughs> it might be a while. I'm glad I watched it, but... Yeah, because Adam Sandler has put out some trash recently. The worst trash Adam Sandler movie I ever watched, and I turned it off after like 20 minutes, was Sandy Wexler. Is that the one where he makes so shoes? bad. No, that's The Cobbler. Sandy Wexler is like, he's a talent manager in LA. Uh, and it's really, really bad. And he has this voice, this accent in it. I remember watching and be like, okay, I hope this is just a little bit. And it goes back to something normal. And he just stays with the accent the whole time. And it was so annoying that I turn that shit off my my worst one is uh don't mess with the zohan oh that's a classic i thought that one was like really like stupid and i just remember that one's a classic yeah but like that and like the the ridiculous six and stuff like he he just has this stretch of these ridiculously like awful movies like i like adam sandler like in murder mystery where he's just kind of himself and he's just like that character I don't like where he tries to like put on makeup and put on an accent and like become a character. Yeah, you like, like when Adam Sandler like fuck like fuck off, you know. Well, I like Adam Adam Sandler is playing a character in Safety Brothers. Yeah, but the Safety Brothers are like at the helm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like they're gonna make it good. Like he actually has to, he actually has to prepare for it. Yeah. Like yeah. in rehearsal and like get, like develop the character and find things that they want to shoot. You know. And, yeah. And like it's such not- a good oh I love that movie. Ra-ta-ta-ta-ta. So next on the docket, a film that I really enjoy, I really liked, and I was very surprised by. And that's what you get when you watch films from the Criterion Collection. <laughs> Wait, which one is it? Il Surpasso. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Il Surpasso is a magnificent little picture. I don't even want to say it's little. I would just say, like, for an Italian post-neorealist film, I mean, it is a neorealist film, but it's a little, like, a little different than the usual sort of Fellini, Michelangelo Antonioni wave, mm-hmm. Robert Brissol, or not Robert Brissol, Robert Brissolini type beat. El Surpasso, directed by Dino Risi with Jean-Louis Trignon and Bruno something, or something Bruno. It's basically about a, a guy who's really reserved, studious, and doesn't really like in, to go out and enjoy life. Probably thinking about his whole life, like ahead of him and everything, you know, like planning for the future, being a lawyer, or studying to be a lawyer, something like that. Yeah, he's studying, yeah. This guy comes in who is the exact opposite. How do they, he meets him in his apartment, but how does he reel him in? I think he says, can I borrow your phone? He's able to go up and use the studious one's phone. He says, oh, you know, the person didn't pick up. Are you hungry? Come on, let's go out and get some food. Yeah, he, so it's, like, it's a road movie, and this guy who's like the fun, spirited guy, who's also reckless, brings this guy out on a road trip movie, and it, we spend a day with him going through all these like cities in Italy, like outside of Rome, basically. Yeah. And for the majority of it, the, the studious one, uh, John louis Trudeau, is trying to get away from him. Mm. He's trying to like strategize how he can come up with an excuse to go back home, keep studying, you know? It just keeps dragging on. He just, he can never get home. The more the picture goes on, the more they grow to kind of respect and like one another in their differences. Mm. It's really cool to see. Yeah, you know? and you grow and you learn about the characters. Mm-hmm. You learn about this guy mm-hmm. who's like a, a crazy part of your guy and like his backstory and his wife and his kid and all that through the story. And they like crash all these parties and stuff. And it's just, it's so cool how it's set up. And it's mm-hmm. it's like a fun hangout movie too. But also it's, it's a movie that has you know a lot of heart to it it has yeah. it has a lesson to teach you about taking taking life and and making what you want of it the goal i understood is like you're kind of supposed to find an approach to life in between the two men you know one's a little too studious one's a little too um uptight and the other one is a little too breezy and non-committal and he's like an a- he's also an asshole yeah, he's also an asshole. You're supposed to kind of find like a like a, a fine line in between the two characters of 
you know, how to approach life in a way that you make the most of it. And I thought it was a really cool message. It plays really well. I love Italian cinema. Maybe one of the best Italian movies I've seen, you know? Yeah, definitely one of the best Italian neorealism films. And it's also, it is a classic in Italy too. Like people actually know about it in Italy. Like if you talk to like regular folk out there, they're like, uh, when they talk about like classic Italian cinema, they're like, I- I've been recommended Il, Surpa- Il Surpasso. Mm-hmm. And people have like talked about it, like, oh yeah, it'll surpass it. They they know they know about it. A lot of Italian directors that I bring up or movies that I bring up to Italians that they don't know it because I think they're just popular in America or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Like who? Like like Fellini stuff. And- no, they know who they know who Federico Fellini is. They do know who Antonioni is. They know Bernardo Bertolucci and shit. But and they know like Dario Argento. Mm-hmm. But like they don't know like Lucio Fulci and like Mario Bava. If I like name drop them, mm-hmm. they won't like recognize it. They know like Sergio Leone, but mm-hmm. they don't know Sergio Capucci. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Damn, there's so many good filmmakers from Italy. Oh yeah, it's like my favorite country for movies. Yeah. I love Italy. I love Dude, France, that's my favorite too. country for movies, I swear to God. Really? I mean, it, ha- it might be. Yeah. That What's... makes me happy, dude, because it's, it's definitely one of my favorites. Dude. I'm a huge Fellini fan. Dude, that's a that. good topic for a video. No, El Surpasso is definitely up there. I really, like, recommend it. It is a road movie, and I'm not, like, super big fan of road movies, typically. I'm not, like, opposed to them. It's not like I don't like them. I just... But they can be surprising. Like, this one, El Surpasso, is a great road movie, and it's fun to watch, even though it's in black and white. It has subtitles. It came out in 1960. 364. Uh, it, it was black and white. Are you sure? El Surpasso? Yeah. Yeah, El Surpasso was in black and white. I know. Just like, it's hard Damn. for me to remember because, like, I think back on it and I'm like, Damn. I, rem- I remember when the daughter put on a wig. I'm like, okay, you can see, like, the change in her hair color, you know, but it's because it's a black wig. Like, it's just hard for me to remember this thing. That surprised me. And then the hit surprised me by Stephen Frears with John Hurt and. As a road mm-hmm. movie. Yeah. It, it reminds me a lot of, like, La Strada, in oh, a yeah. way. Just the way there's these two characters that are kind of at odds, that by the end, they kind of grow this admiration for one another. In this movie, I love how Bruno is an asshole, the one that's kind of more of like, you know, uncommit- non-committal and, and kind of like an idiot. Mm. But he's, he's trying to nurture this love and fascination for life out of this other guy this whole time he's very patient with him kind of like brotherly towards him he doesn't really want anything from the other guy you can see how he like is kind of sleazy and borrows money from people and it's like oh he owes him this he owes him that but he's never trying to do that maliciously you know what i mean yeah he's he, he is really trying to like nurture this guy and take care of him and and i thought that was really sweet where it was kind of this this love for this stranger that you don't normally yeah. see he was trying to get him to enjoy his life and that's what the movie's about is like trying to actually in, in, enjoy your life not yeah. be so like stressed out or whatever you know and um, we're not going to spoil the ending i'm not going to spoil the ending but it's one of the greatest endings i've ever seen in a movie <laughs> this has one of the greatest endings and why yeah what makes the movie so great is partially because of like a big part is actually the ending because yeah. it, it really like it really floored me yeah like right after that ending happened i was like damn but it made sense yeah you know it made sense in, in, in like a um kind of like a story beat just to cap off everything like Dude, it, it, was it really leaves the audience with with a clear message and, and, and a clear thing to take from it yeah you know? bro yeah that that whole part in the end is so like it's actually like kind of tense to watch yeah you know no there's some some surprise in this movie especially like the driving and stuff in it like when he's like yeah they're, they're all driving crazy during the movie and stuff and you're kind of like oh my god like this guy's crazy and like yeah. imagine being a passenger to that and being like oh shit you know and then he learns to like enjoy it the stuff by the end he's like trying to enjoy it and yeah the ending is one of the best endings i've ever seen yeah it's tragic but it's it's really good recommended i'm a big fan of john louis trinity y'all yeah you are z z that's a movie everyone should see that's a underrated movie we gotta rewatch that mm-hmm. we gotta watch that with jake the great silence sergio Corbucci. he's also in three colors red dude he is watch yeah okay i'm i'm excited for that the conformist mm-hmm. by bernardo bertolucci and some other shit i can't think of i mean i saw him in a giallo called mm-hmm. so sweet so perverse which was all right I'm just a fan. He's like up there with like Alain Delon for me. Yeah. He's one of those um, kind of boyish looking men, Mm. you know, that's kind of like the silent type. 
can carry himself in like a yeah. lot of different roles. He doesn't like say he's like very quiet. Yeah, like, that's the role he plays. But I feel that because I'm like a really quiet person, like chilled out, like discreet, you know, nondescript guy, mm-hmm. but also handsome, also boyish looking and short and um, smell like baguettes. <laughs> El Surpaso, great movie. El Surpaso is great. Go watch it. Even though it's in black and white, it has subtitles, but. People don't want to watch it because the sub- people don't want to watch it because they have subtitles that they read them. And it's yeah. black and white because they think it's boring. But anyway, yeah. peace. Ra-ta-ta-ta-ta. The other day, we went over to our friend Jake's house. He's got a huge collection of all these movies. And it took us a second to pick because he's got so many good classics. But we finally came up with the decision of something we all wanted to watch. And that was The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover. Directed by Peter Greenway, who also wrote it, 1989. Mm-hmm. This is a movie that I've personally been meaning to watch for a while, and I think you have as well. Didn't really know what to expect going into it, other than I knew they would kind of have more of a play-like feel to the cinematography. The set pieces were as if they're doing a, a play. It was cool. It was shot really well. I love it. I love how it just holds these like wide shots for most of the movie. And when you do get a close up, it's kind of jarring. You're like, whoa, fuck. I can like see the color of their eyes, you know? Mm. It, it deals with some kind of, um, I guess, grotesque subject matters. Yeah, it's, it's definitely fucked up. Mm-hmm. And it's sexy and it's, also fucked up, and people die in like terrible ways. Yeah, it's, it's perverse. Yeah. Dude, I thought it, I thought it was pretty great. Like after I thought about it for some time, it's actually a pretty great film. Mm-hmm. When I, I first heard about it, because people were just talking about it and stuff. Like I think Ari Aster was talking about it on a podcast I was listening to, and then they talked about it in Video Archives podcast with Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino hates it. Roger Avery loves it, right? Yeah, I thought it was really well done, and all the acting is really good, and it's really intense, and mm-hmm. the it's it's fucked up and. Yeah. Also, it's very the expressionist like kind of style, the formalistic style that they do is really cool. Basically, it takes place in this restaurant slash hotel. I think it's just a restaurant. Yeah. It takes place in a restaurant where this mob boss just took over, and mm-hmm. now he just like tortures everyone there. Like you know, not, not like physical torture, but like he like fucks up. He like yeah, you know, he basically just tortures everyone there. I mean, he's like. He's a dictator. Yeah, of. he's like he's talking to the cook. He's like, I'm here so I can offer you protection. He's like, well, what do I need protection from? It's like, well, you need protection from me. Mm. <laughs> it's like, yeah. he's basically threatening this guy, you yeah. know, threatening everyone there. He basically runs the entire neighborhood. He's kind of this gangster that just like, is just this boisterous, loud mouth, abusive. obnoxious person. He's abusive too. Yeah, he's super abusive to his wife, who's played by Helen Marin and... She's fucking great in this, dude. Yeah. She's so good in this. Yeah, it's like one of her best roles. Yeah. Oh that my I've God. seen. It. But in the story, she, she starts an affair with a visitor to the restaurant slash mm-hmm. hotel, I guess. Mm-hmm. And they're just sneaking around and stuff, like having sex in the hotel slash restaurant. And the, the mob boss, like, comes on to it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like... Like, yeah. they, they play it as if it's, like almost horror where it's like he could be around every corner you know the way the camera moves like you don't really see what's out of the frame you don't really know if he's there or not and um, it had sweeney todd vibes yeah definitely definitely has sweeney, it has sweeney todd, todd vibes. vibes for sure and mm-hmm. the art direction the set the little kids singing like that's straight out <laughs> sweeney todd dude yeah you know? I, I didn't like that I know, but that's like a yeah. that's like a play thing what know? i didn't like about the film is just kind of that 80s feel to it Mm-hmm. That kind of 80s gloss, a little cringe, sort of overly melodramatic in a way. Even though it's a play, but I just felt like... Yeah. That was the only thing that, that kind of stuck out to me that I was kind of like annoyed by. And, and the yeah. kids singing and stuff. But other than that, like, it's it's got everything you want. You know, it's violent. It's an like, interesting story, interesting character. Like, the mm-hmm. mob boss, the guy who plays him, is just this despicable guy. But he's so, yeah. like, fun to watch. Can't remember his name, um, but he plays Dumbledore. Um, the way they were shot is just beautiful. Yeah, the yeah. Guy. It's like the lighting's fucking amazing. Just I love when it'll be in this red lighting, right? And then the, her dress will be red, and then she'll transition through a door to the bathroom mm. where there's just this like white light, 
and her dress is white. He yeah. does that costume yeah. change, and yeah. it's just so something about it, so stylistic and yeah, so I love unique. It. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love the way it's shot. And it's the guy who shot Umbrellas of Shabu. Oh, he shot last year at Marion Bad and oh, Umbrellas yeah. of Shabu. Yeah, that's right. That's Man, right. Man, he's so like he has that kind of dreamy. Yeah, definitely type style to it. Yeah, and I think he shot Belle de Jour as well. Okay, which is a fucking okay. amazing it's kind of fantasy style that he has. It's gorgeous. Like, there's something that doesn't sit right to me about the ending. And it's not supposed to sit right with you. You know, you're supposed to be, like, repulsed. There's something about it that I just have to, like, work out in my head again. Or maybe watch it again, you know? See if the ending really hits for me. Because there's something about El Surpaso where that ending, I felt like I didn't want it to happen. But it hit. It, like, sent the message home. Something about this ending where, like, I have to watch it again and really figure out if I liked it or not. Mm. One thing I loved about this, though, is I love how when the wife and the person she's having an affair with first meet, they don't talk at all, you know? Yeah. And the cook keeps bringing them the same course, and they're, like, eyeing each other from across the room, eating the same food. There's something about, you know, the idea of mixing food and, and sex together that is, like, really cool to me. I don't know. It was really, uh, the way it played out felt very, uh, unforced, you mm-hmm. know, whereas I feel like in any other movie that could feel like forced upon something. You can see her situation. You can see his situation. You can see how they fall and, uh, you know, in the same interlocking step for the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. It was, I'm glad I watched it. Mm-hmm. It's in my hard drive, my movie watching. Yeah. Like I know what it is and shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's cool. I've been meaning to watch it for a while, so I'm glad I did that. Yeah, definitely. When I first watched it, I was like, oh, it wasn't like that good. And then I thought about it, like, oh, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, <laughs> I like the style. Honestly, the style is the, really the reason. And the characters and shit. Yeah, it felt very, like, I don't know, something about the whole world that they built felt very, like, just dreary and, and depressing. And I don't know, it just didn't feel, like, based in reality, you know? Mm-hmm. The, the world they were able to create with just like a a few couple set pieces was like amazing. So we watched this movie from 2018, a Danish thriller called The Guilty. I forgot the name of the guy who directed it, but this is like his debut feature Mm -hmm. that they made for $500,000 in Denmark. The Guilty, we followed this dispatch officer Mm -hmm. in Copenhagen and we, we see his kind of little, not routine necessarily, but we just kind of see what his life is like all about at like this job, like picking up phone calls, getting like prank calls, getting like, you know, rejecting people who call the cops or whatever, like, yeah. you know. And he's in a call center. Yeah, he's in a call center. We just kind of see how his, his work life is. Mm-hmm. And then he gets a call from a woman that's kidnapped. That's like the inciting incident to the whole plot. Yeah. And then we go down this whole investigation in it. Yeah, we unravel things about the case through just simple phone calls. And the, invest- the investigation doesn't take doesn't leave this this office, this dispatch office. It all yeah. takes place in one location. And it's yeah, all we fun. never see another location. The camera's just in this office on him answering calls. There's something really creative and really clever, and you really have to have a good script to carry your story if you're going to do that. And they definitely deliver with that premise. I thought it's really cool how you just see this kind of investigation start to unravel through different phone calls, through talking to different suspects and different people, that he's able to kind of piece together the narrative, but you're also, as an audience, able to piece together his story at the same time, and like how he got to that call center, how he got demoted to work there. Yeah, you slowly find out things, and then there's some definitely some twists and some turns that I did not expect in this story. Yeah, yeah. Of this kidnapped woman. I really like this movie a lot. I think it's great. I think it's really great. I'm a big fan of like minimalist style and film. Like I'm a very I, I like that 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 look. Like John Pierre Melville, like Brisson, yeah, type yeah. shit going down. And there's literally like no music in it. It's, it's literally just like voices. You just see him talking on the phone. Basically, it's just like him talking on like a phone call, dude. The yeah. whole movie, but it's so tense because the way they use like sound and the dialogue, it's it's so cool. Yeah. Like, I love Locke a lot with Tom Hardy, Mm -hmm. where it just all takes place through phone calls and this guy in a car. And this follows that same type of of thing. And it's it's amazing how they 
get you so much into what's going on just with like mm-hmm. of guys sitting at a desk like taking phone calls i know i know it's like sounds so stupid but their execution is like top notch yeah and it's like what you don't see makes it like for some reason that makes it more intense yeah when you like learn things or you're like he's hearing stuff on a phone call that like mm-hmm. really like you have to like it forces you to imagine it in your head which is like more powerful than any like visual cinema and you have to have a great actor to like carry this yeah and he was amazing the guy that plays the main character and you can see it on his face and as like the beats unfold like he unfolds with you mm-hmm and there's something really cathartic about this whole movie. They made a remake with Jake Gyllenhaal on Netflix. Haven't seen that yet. Yeah, we should have watched that first and then talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we just could scrap it. But yeah, they remade it with Jake Gyllenhaal, directed by Antoine Fuqua. I haven't seen it, but I want to see it. They, I think they just copy it. They literally just copy like yeah a movie. That's I mean that tends to be what they do when they like go to these like niche Scandinavian movies. Mm. They seem to copy it like beat by beat. No, just like the the technique, like the form of this film, really lends itself to the like viewers' engagement in the story. Yeah, it just like really like draws you in. You're like really there with him, like listening through his ear what's going on because you can't see it either. Yeah, but like he's also imagining it, and you're imagining it. Shit. Yeah, I think they, like, shot it in, like, eight weeks or something, and the sound design took, like, way longer. Like, the post took a long time. Jake Gyllenhaal, like, reached out to him to do the remake in America, but he turned it down. But now he's doing a movie with Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, it's basically a graphic novel from Scandinavia or something like that. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I love my little... I love little Scandinavian thrillers, bro. Yep. Like, that coldness, that blue, yeah. stark coldness like yeah because they're just yeah. like oh we have four hours of sunlight today <laughs> you know like yeah yeah how are we gonna shoot this yeah scan even starkness stylistically like you kind of see it in like lars von trier and like insomnia like girl dragon tattoo yeah like yeah. thomas Winterbrag. and i look forward to seeing whatever this guy's output is because i think he's a really cool creative guy yeah. and i love i gotta support my like scandinavian brothers too you know i love when like a little scan even film breaks out like that. This is a movie is a great movie. I recommend it. I thought something that might be fun to do. You're a huge Christopher Nolan fan and Oppenheimer's coming out soon. Why don't we try to rank what we think are our favorites? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Christopher Nolan. Like I think him and Tarantino are the go- two goats of their generation. Christopher Nolan, I go and see every single film he drops in the theaters like first day. Same with Tarantino. There's no other director that I do that for. There's directors that I'll go see in theaters, but not first day. Like, I'll make sure to go see them. Yeah. Maybe opening weekend or something. I went to go see Interstellar. When that came out, I saw it three days in a row in IMAX. And then, like, I saw it, like, a few other times when it was on the run. I probably saw it, like, eight times in a year, bro. Interstellar? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, like, and then, like, I saw Dunkirk, you know, when that first day that came out a couple times. And then I, yeah, Tenet. I saw that a few times. I probably saw it like three times, three, four times. Damn. But I've probably seen it like seven, six times now. Mm-hmm. We're Christopher Nolan fans out here. Yeah, we're, we're doing a little, we're doing a ranking list. All 11 of his movies that are out now. Yeah. From from worst move, his worst movies to his best movies. Yeah. Let's get into it. I'm not the biggest Christopher Nolan fan, I'm the preferences for saying. Um, but I definitely have respect for a lot of his movies. I think a lot of his movies have had a huge impact on me. I know it can be like hit and miss for a lot of people with what he does. The things they say where his stories don't make sense or his sound mixing's like off, you know? Yeah. That's not really the shit that bothers me. I think the thing that bothers me a little bit, how he can kind of be up his own ass a little bit sometimes with, yeah. with his filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a little bit um, too, too cool. Like, I don't know. There's something about that 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 rubs me the wrong way as opposed to like oh his stories don't make sense his sound mixing for tenants off yeah. i love when he does something that doesn't make sense like, yeah maybe I, sometimes he can blow himself a little bit yeah when he's at the top of his game there's very few directors living nowadays that can pull off what he can pull off yeah couldn't disagree with you on yeah. that one dude. yeah yeah this is his scale he's like one of the most powerful directors working in hollywood and always has something and to you gotta do. rewatch them too like yeah. the rewatch value on his movies is insane dude yeah but I love also how he kind of he's kind of a themed director or, or something all his movies always have something to do with time 
in some form of um, time passing that is a linchpin to the narrative of his story, you know? And I think that's really, really cool. I really like the way he, like, edits with time. And I think it's super innovative. It's fresh. Yeah. Like, he has a fresh approach to filmmaking, and he's saying that, no, film, like, we haven't explored everything we have. We're still, like, pushing the boundaries and discovering new things. Number 11 for me, out of his 11 films, his worst movie is The Dark Knight Rises from 2012. Dark Knight Rises? I can see that. Personally, I have Dark Knight Rises number 9. So there's two movies there below it for me. It's just, like, not that good, and it's just a mess. In terms of pacing, story... Yeah, um, like... Story and like um, when I watch it, I'm like, what the fuck were they doing? Yeah, that's yeah. why it's at like number eleven because I watch it, I'm like, oh, what the fuck were they doing? Like, and so obviously like, he just had to make this movie because it was like probably part of a deal or something, and mm-hmm. he was gonna have Heath Ledger in it too, but he died. No, nah, it's just a mess. It's like my least favorite one. It's not. You know, there's some cool stuff to it. Like Bane is cool. Yeah, the, the, the plane sequence in the beginning is cool. And that's about it, dude. Yeah, it's not a movie I look forward to rewatch. And there's like weird CGI of the thing flying and shit, like the bat plane. Yeah. That's gonna that's aged so poorly now, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, I probably like Batman vs. Superman more than this. It's kind of a it's a movie that drags on a little too much. There is a form of nostalgia though. Having stuck it through all the Batman movies, and this is before Marvel, you know, really came to the forefront of superhero movies. This is like the superhero franchise. Christopher Nolan's Batman. Something about, like, the conclusion to it, even though it's, like, a mess of a movie, it still has a little bit of a um, dopamine effect. Yeah, like, thinking of The Dark Knight, thinking of Batman Begins, and thinking about how this is, like, the conclusion. I wish it had been a better conclusion. There's still a little bit of nostalgia in there. And you get that cliffhanger ending, like, with Robin, and they never fulfilled. Yeah. But what's your like, number 11 pick? This is, okay, this is, this is unranked then. My number 11 would be Insomnia. Okay, and yeah. Well, I've seen the original Insomnia with um, Stone Skarsgård. I like it. I if, if that's the, you know, the gist I'm getting from it is that, you know, Al Pacino's the cop and Robin Williams is the, you know, guy he's trying to catch. Like, I, I get I get the gist of it. It's a good premise. I saw the original. I have no desire to see the remake of it. No, I I, I think you should see the remake. It's it's, it's worth watching. Okay, I'll, 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 I would watch that with you. I'll watch it. I'll watch it. That's why I ranked it eleven. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's unranked. That's unranked to them. So what's your number ten? My number ten is following. I don't think it's his worst movie. Like talking about this now, even I'm like, well, maybe it's better than The Dark Knight Rises in terms of like a little indie film. It was really cool. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed um, what Christopher Dolan was able to do on such a small budget and still craft a compelling story with the editing, the, the, the pacing of the movie, and how he reveals reveals the story over time. I thought it was really innovative and really, really creative. Yeah, I, I like the following. I like, I, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm very inspired by it, and I like how much he was able to, the story he was able to tell with like so little and for your first film. It's really cool. And especially like in the 90s he made it for like six thousand dollars using his friends and minimal stock footage like everything all the money was spent on the film and the development like the of the film and they just used locations that they they could use and yeah just put it on a call together in a creative non-linear way i mean his friend in the movie like just randomly cuts his hair you know yeah, you can tell, yeah. like there's very little commitment holding it all together and he just he works around that and he's able to come up with like a cohesive thing is is impressive yeah I, I like that i like i like following my number 10 is batman begins batman begins uh it's his most studio gloss picture i think it was cool watching when i was a kid i don't really think it does too much for me it doesn't do much for me. I guess it's cool to see the origin story, but I didn't really find the origin story like even that cool anyway. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like blown by it. I remember thinking like, oh, it's cool that they're doing a Batman. This is like a more realistic, darker Batman. It's serious. Which is cool with like the car, the new car. Like, there's like a tank. It's like all industrial. Uh, I like that. That was like cool to be introduced to that world. But as a movie, like I don't really care for it too much. Mm-hmm. Batman Begins... Is my number eight. I grew up kind of, there was like a small period when we were like children where the Batman movies were like George Clooney, Val Kilmer, Michael Keaton, you know, like those were our Batmans. And like you, you would see them on TV or like your parents would show them to you, you know. And then suddenly like there's like a shift of like how you understand Batman. He's like, 
Christian Bale and he's cooler and he's just like there's something like you said like a little more industrial and like Batman he's like very grounded and it's not like fantastical it's like practical I thought that was really cool I, I really liked that it was a good launch to Batman that we know yeah, and it's the first Christopher Nolan movie that I ever saw. Like, I didn't know what a director was, but I was a kid. It's technically the first Christopher Nolan movie I ever saw. So that's also an interesting factoid. What is your number? What's your number nine? Dark Knight Rises. Uh, my number nine is Insomnia. I actually do like Insomnia, but I, I like the, the remake. I mean, the original, like, a lot. It has that cool stark style to it, and... Christopher Nolan definitely ripped off the style of the feel of Insomnia with Memento as well. But Insomnia, like, it's it's more, it's definitely a more Hollywood picture. And it's like, there's, they're trying to do too much with the style and shit. And it's not as, like, the original is more stark. And I wish I, that's what makes it, like, better. And it's also the original story and shit. But I like Al Pacino, Robin Williams. They do a good job. It's, it's a fun movie to watch. We should definitely watch it sometime. Okay. And what's your number eight now? My number eight is Following, which we just, yeah. which we talked about. Okay, yeah. What's your number eight? My number eight was uh, Batman Begins. Okay, well, we talked about that. Okay. Now we're getting into... Some controversial territory. Yeah, some controversial territory. Yeah. You want to start number seven? <laughs> <laughs> I have Dunkirk at number seven. You have Dunkirk at number seven? Yeah. Okay. Hey, it's, uh, yeah, tell me about that. Dunkirk is a good movie. I, I, I think it's a great World War II movie. We're getting to the section where it's like everything's great from this point yeah. on. Everything Even though people would say, like, oh, there's certain movies that are bad. Like, people could say that Tenet's bad or, like, Interstellar, but, like... Yeah, no, Dunkirk Dunkirk is a cool movie. Like, when I first saw it in theaters, I was kind of like, okay, that was interesting. It was it didn't really, like, floor me. And then, like, I kind of realized over time the masterpiece that it was. Mm -hmm. Like, seeing it a few times and the time, space, and memory aspect of it is great. I love that. And it's just, like, such a boots on the ground war like you're in it like you're with these soldiers and stuff what they're going yeah. through and i like them the the day month the the day week hour template that he uses and stuff and great action it's just it, I, I think it's a great movie mm -hmm. that's all i have to say it's higher for me so I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later my number seven though and i love this movie dude is prestige yeah that movie that was one of the first movies i saw like probably on like probably on fx or something in the middle of the day i was watching it just how it blows you away with every like twist and turn and it's so cool it's such a good movie i love just you know you have hugh jackman and christian bale at odds with one another they're just so good opposites like throughout the entire movie that mm. there's something like so compelling about them as characters that that you love you know yeah they're great christian bale hugh jackman scarlett joe uh, michael kane david bowie Re rebecca hollerton yeah i mean they're uh, it's a great movie yeah i have that a little higher okay number six we're getting a little this is, a little, this is getting a little controversial now this is gonna be this is controversial my number six pick dude uh, number six is Inception. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great movie. Great movie. Really innovative, dope, super critically acclaimed. Like this could, this is probably a lot of people's number one spot. Mm -hmm. Number two, probably like a lot of people would say this is like his best movie. Yeah. My personal taste, like it's not, it's not like I, my, what I personally enjoy more watching. There's other movies up there. I find more interesting and stuff. This one is where he gets like a little dick sucky. Right? Yeah. Like Inception, he gets a little dick sucky with it. Like yeah. the dream in a dream. Whoa, so fucking mind blowing, bro. Whoa, dream in a dream, dude. <laughs> Time is slower. Dude, that makes sense, bro. Because when I go to sleep, I feel like I'm in a dream for like only a few minutes. And then it's like seven hours later, dude. Fuck, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like yeah. that shit and, you know, but obviously it's a classic. What more can I say? Inception, what, what, there's nothing else to say about it. Inception was cool because that's where it was really able to start getting like these, like this ensemble of like great actors. Yeah. And also yeah. this is like his first really original blockbuster that he yeah. made, like with a yeah. huge 160 mil budget, re rain mm -hmm. written and directed original story blockbuster yeah. which is that's what he can do there's like no other people like who can do what he that he that has that clout that he does yeah i don't know like the twists and turns of that movie yeah my number six this is a great this is another great movie dude. there's so many great movies uh, my number six is memento i think this is like one of those movies that like when i was first like getting into like watching movies as like a 
with a, with the more appreciation than just enjoying it. Uh, this is one of the first movies I watched. Blows you away. I mean, I fucking love Guy Pierce just for the rest of my life because of this movie and like the storytelling and what they're able to do with with time and and how one side's moving backwards, one side's moving forwards, and it's kind of a huge mind fuck. And you can dig so much into the film and get so much from it if you want to invest your time into it. There's something about that form of filmmaking that when I was introduced to it, that's a huge impression on me. I think Memento is like, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal movie. Memento is higher up. I want to get to Memento later, bro. Number five, I got Tenet. I love Tenet. I also have Tenet at number five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Tenet's just dope. It's fucking trippy as hell. Yeah. It's so fun to rewatch over and over again. Fuck the haters, dude. Because, like, Tenet is the closest we're going to get to Nolan directing a James Bond. Fucking, it's so badass, dude. Like, I don't care that it's, like, they say lines that don't make any fucking sense. There's a lot of plot holes in it, whatever. I had a good time watching it. Yeah, I don't care if it, like, makes sense. It's just about the feeling it gives you when you when you watch it. And yeah. That's, that's it. And you see some trippy-ass ideas explored. Mm -hmm. And the scope of it is just insane. I love that I was able to watch it in theaters, too, you know? It's supposed to be, you know, I, a, lot, a lot of people say, oh, it was supposed to be the movie it, that brought people back. But, like, I did go to the theaters. Like, it was, like, a cool release yeah. from COVID. Tenet was released on my birthday, bro. The first thing went, the first day came was on my birthday, my 24th birthday. I went to go see Tenet. Nice. I dude. drove to Sacramento from Sonoma. <laughs> we were, like, late, a little bit late, because my brother and my stepdad, they, like, hated it and shit. Yeah. But I was like, no, there's something more to be seen with it. And I saw it again, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not a movie you can watch, like, just one time, dude. Like, if you're going to get into 10, you have to watch it multiple times. You can't just watch it once. Yeah. The effects are fucking phenomenal in there. Oh, it. man, yeah. Like, I love the way it plays out. It just looks so cool when shit's going backwards. Yeah. Oh my God. Like I said, time, space, and memory going on. Like, I, that's what he's, like, so good at. It, it's it's so suave. And John David Washington's, like, so cool and collected in it the entire way. I'm just like, this guy's, like, a secret agent. Yeah. You know? There's something so cool about that. Yeah. Robert Pattinson, dude, like, hitting yeah. his stride. Yeah, this yeah, movie. yeah. What do you have a number four? My number four is Interstellar. Yeah, that's my number four as well. Yeah. Yeah, Interstellar is number four. Yeah. Like I said, I watched it five times in theaters when it was first and originally released, and it's a really good emotional journey, and it's very nostalgia for me now at this point. Like, it's a classic in my mind. Yeah. The effects are, yeah, dude, all the space shit is fucking amazing, dude. Yeah. So, here's the thing, right? When I first watched it, I don't think I really had an appreciation for it. I thought it was kind of like a little bit like Inception, you know? Mm. Um, I have like a huge appreciation for it nowadays because I think what he's able to do with it and the story he's able to tell, it's a character-driven story. You know, it's a, it's a story about a father and a daughter separated through time. That emotion like really hits in the movie, especially when... Matthew McConaughey is, like, trying to come home, you know, and, and she's like, hey, I'm the age you were when you left now. Oh, dude, that was so trippy. That shit, like, really hits you, and it's like, ah, oh, dude, there's something so beautiful about that movie, and, like, what this guy's able to sacrifice, willing to sacrifice for, you know, the greater good of humanity because he's called upon to do so. Oh, dude, it's such a good movie, and it's beautiful. It looks so beautiful, that movie. Yeah. <laughs> No, all the space and the, the... It has, like, the greatest score ever written by Hans Zimmer. It's really good. It's really good. It's, yeah. like, one of the best ever made. Yeah. Definitely best. The best Christopher Nolan score is Hans Zimmer. And then, yeah, yeah all of the space shit is just amazing. It's very emotional and sad, and the scope is insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's insane, the scope of this movie. Yeah, and it's... It's, it's a great movie. You would have asked me like a couple of years ago, I probably would have ranked it like way lower, but I think I have a new appreciation for it and I think it's a great movie. Yeah, I gotta rewatch that, dude. That's like the next Christopher Nolan movie I'll probably will watch. Uh, number three, I have The Prestige. Okay, yeah. What can I say? It's a great movie. It's a great, like, great twists and turns. Like, yeah. A couple way through. And, and it's about magicians, dude. Yeah, like, I mean, it's badass. Who doesn't like magicians, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like cool magicians, you know? And yeah. The period piece and the, the time, space, and memory aspect of the, the story being told and the flashbacks and whatever. Yeah. And it's like the, the different levels of commitment they're both willing to commit. Yeah. And the twist. Both their twists are like 
fucking they blow you away. It's so yeah. good, you know? It's so good. I love that movie. My number third is Inception. Um, I remember seeing this movie like just around the right time. It, there's something so creative about it. The art in it is like phenomenal. The the kind of heist setting of the whole thing and how it's like they're trying to they're trying to pull something off. The stakes can be higher, you know. You die in a dream. You die in real life. Some of the set pieces are fucking phenomenal. Joseph Gordon Levitt like going around the hallway, turning, you know, like. It's just so cool. I love the movie. It's a fun movie. I don't know what else to say, you know? Uh, I get that it can be, like, really dick-sucky, and I feel like the emotional connection isn't really there as it is, like, in Interstellar. I feel like you don't really feel the emotion for Leonardo DiCaprio when he's like, I want to get back to my wife. Am I dreaming or am I not dreaming? Or, like, he wants to get back to his kids, you know? I don't really feel like the emotion's, like, fully there. It's a fun movie. It's a really good movie. Yeah, but the movie. twist is really good, too. It's like, oh, what are you doing? Like, is, it's like, is, he a, is he dreaming or is he awake? Oh. Yeah. Like, the most analyzed It's something like the most, like, Christopher Nolan movie yeah. ever. But uh, I love that movie. Yeah. What's your number two? The Dark Knight. Uh, what, what can we say about The Dark Knight, dude? Yeah. Like, it's the greatest superhero movie ever made. Yeah. And it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Greatest crime dramas ever made. Really reinvented fucking shit, bro. Like, greatest action movie ever made. Really just blew the doors off and everything after that just followed. And, yeah. Try to, at least. Like, no, no one's ever been able to come close to, like, in terms of superhero and cinema medium. Um, this is why, like, Christopher Nolan is one of the goats. This is why he's up there with Tarantino. It's my number one. You know, Batman aside, Batman franchise aside, the movie can stand alone as like a crime drama, just on its own. The cat and mouse game with Heath Ledger and Christian Bale is just phenomenal. It's like he meets fucking Christopher Nolan and Batman. Like, it's so good, dude. Obviously, like, this is like Michael Mann's heat, but like with Batman. Yeah. And the Joker. Oh, it's such a good movie. That's a movie I rewatch every couple of years. Just cause yeah, it's a I'm classic, like, dude. Yeah, I'm like, is it really that good? It, was I just nostalgic? And I always watch it. I'm always blown away. No, and know? the message in the end and shit. It's just so deep, too. It's so good, dude. Like fucking Joker. It's so deep with the he Harvey Dent stuff. Joker. Yeah, he Ledger's Joker's like he's gonna go down as like one of the best villains ever. He he, he is. He is. is I he? mean, just like years to come, Doctor- like. 40 years down the line, people are going to look back at this and be like, holy shit. Testament of Dr. Mabuse? Yes, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great movie. Yeah, that... You guys should check out The Testament of Dr. Mabuse because... Fritz Lang? He, like, ripped it off for this movie, for sure. And the villain character, yeah. bro. Oh, yeah. So cool. So it's a cool. But yeah, Dark Knight registered in the National Congress Library for a cultural, historical, and aesthetic purposes. So... Yeah. But it's a classic, one of the best movies ever made, for real. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And your number two is Dunkirk? My number two is Dunkirk, yeah. The more I think about it, the more I love it, and the more I re- want, want to rewatch it. I just love the pacing of the movie. It feels so still, but everything feels, like, so deadly at the same time, you know? every All the characters feel isolated. They feel isolated in, in Dunkirk. They feel isolated on the ocean. They feel isolated in the sky, you know? Mm. But they're... All the different storylines playing out together. I think it's one of the best war movies ever made. Now we have All Quiet on the Western Front, which I think he'd maybe give it a run for its money. But yeah, I thought Dunkirk was phenomenal. I have to rewatch it again. It's such a good movie. Yeah. yeah. The the dogfight scenes are so good. Oh, Though, man. I've never seen anything like that that just blew me away. Of like, you're on the edge of your seat. And it feels so realistic and it's like you could die at any minute, but it's also so silly how it's just like they're trying to hit the most impossible thing in the air yeah. and that's determining their life or death. You yeah, know? it's really intense. It's very suspenseful. Yeah. Definitely. And then I love the boat shit with Mark Rylance and yeah. stuff and Riley Keoghan. Yeah, Barry Keoghan. Barry yeah. Keoghan, up, up and coming actor. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I see a lot of, there's a lot of potential in this in the guy, dude. Like yeah. He's, he's going to be, I think he might actually be like a big actual star. Well, yeah. I mean, he's been in a lot of things like Killing Other Sacred Deer and then now he's going to be in the next Gladiator with Ridley Scott. Like, Banshees of a Nishiri. But anyway, so my number one pick is Memento from 2000. This movie left the like a really big impression on me when I was 15 when I first saw saw it yeah changed my mind about what movies could be for yeah. sure what that movie did like i didn't know that was like allowed yeah. to, to do that and i just thought it was super duper creative this whole like story running backwards thing really left an impression on me and i still when i watch it today like i still like 
get blown away by it. Mm-hmm. Still really a, a dope ass inspiring movie, which maybe like want to make a movie when I watch that movie just because mm-hmm. of how cool it was. And, and it sits with me differently nowadays because what hits now is this sort of this dynamic between like him and his wife and wanting to for like not being able to let go of someone that you love and like, yeah. you know, making up things in your own world to like make up for something that you, you never like come to terms with it and like not knowing something or the time, space and memory aspect of it is the craziest that I've seen in like a Christopher Nolan movie the the yeah. whole backward storytelling and then you can follow like you piece it together and shit and you can actually follow it and it's just yeah. like like answers first questions later and mm-hmm. I love the ending and like the question of like what reality is and fucking Guy Pierce yeah like that it's my number one it's my favorite one my one of my favorite movies of all time probably like in my top 10 favorite movies maybe phenomenal storytelling in the livest movies it's just very like, innovative yeah so innovative so talented um, that script is so tight too it's so tight this the script in memento is just so yeah concise and tight and, and just unique so, and the, the, the new neo-noir feel to it as mm-hmm. well like mm-hmm. the mystery oh. and just grimy too like all the tattoos he has like i remember oh, as a so kid cool. i'm just like what the fuck so and cool just the way like all plays out so so crazy and so cool yeah definitely like has that early 2000s filmmaking vibe for me and that, that just leaves a huge impression as a kid so i'm not discounting that at all i'm excited for uh, oppenheimer yeah oppenheimer 2023 it's gonna be dope dude mm-hmm. yeah i'm i'm excited for its collaboration with um killian murphy yeah killian murphy yeah yeah I'm excited for collaboration with him again they always like do great things together he's a veteran he's a veteran now yeah I bet Chris Renault watches Peaky Blinders. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he's seen a couple episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a lot lot of his friends are in it. (laughs) Anyway, that's our list. What's your list? Leave a comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Suck a dick or something, bitch.